ಇತಿಪಿಸೋ ಬದೇವಾ ಅರೇಹ ಸಂಬುಧೋ ವಿಧ್ಯಾಚರಣ ಸಂಪನ್ನೋ ಸುಗತೋಕವಿದು ಅನುತ್ತರು ಪುರಿಷದಮಸಾರತಿ ಸತ್ತೇವ ಮನೋಸ್ಥಾನ Namaste. So we're continuing with the Maha Satipatthana Sutta. And now we're going to discuss the components of the body. Up till now, the Buddha has been dealing with awareness of the body as a whole. But now we're going to start to look into what's inside. Monks, a monk considers this body up from the soles of the feet and down from the top of the head as a skin bag filled with a variety of unclean things in this body there are head hairs body hairs nails teeth skin muscles tendons bones bone marrow kidneys heart liver membranes spleen lungs stomach intestines chime excrement bile phlegm pus blood sweat fat tears oil and saliva monks it is just like a bag with an opening on both ends that is full of various kinds of grain such as white rice brown rice beans lentils sesame seeds and red rice after pouring them out a person with eyesight could identify them this is white rice this is brown rice these are beans these are lentils these are sesame seeds this is red rice monks in the same way a monk considers this body up from the soles of the feet and down from the top of the head as a skin bag filled with a variety of unclean things In this body there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, muscles, tendons, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, membranes, spleen, lungs, stomach, intestines, chyme, excrement, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, oil, and saliva. In this way one abides, dedicated completely aware and mindful without covetousness or depression about the world observing the body as the body so the buddha doesn't paint a very attractive picture of the body huh? as we'll see in a few verses he regards the body as something that's simply meant for death so because death is inevitable the monk should not be attached but rather he should look at the internals of the body as being a collection of unclean things unclean means that if you touch it your body is considered contaminated have you ever observed a full autopsy not many people have i haven't <laughs> well, who would want to is the point because the insides of the body are not very attractive they're not very nice in fact they're kind of putrid and disgusting the components of the body the body as itself is like a boat like we talked about in the previous episode that can take us across the flowing stream of impressions and desires and thoughts to the farther shore which is nibbana but the boat itself is really not very nice although the function of the boat if we use it well can benefit us still it's made of all kinds of nasty things <laughs> strung together huh 
And that's why the, the Buddha refers to the body as an aggregate. It's not just one thing. Rather, it's a collection of things strung together with common purpose and meaning and DNA. So we shouldn't be so attached to this body. We certainly should not consider the body to be the self in any way. The body is simply an instrument. Now, I have many musical instruments. And I used to be very attached to them. I used to be very affectionate toward them. <laughs> I used to almost see them as companions and helpers because I was very attached to music. But nowadays, after going through training as a Buddhist monk, after going through five years of meditation in the highest holy place in India, I don't have any attachment to them anymore. They're nice, you know, but look at what, what are they made of? My flute is made of iron and silver and copper and the pads, oh my God, the pads are made from animal skins. So it's really not very nice, any woodwind instrument. And even a guitar, you know, or a sitar. Although it's interesting, Indian instruments are made from much more natural ingredients, like gourds and hollowed out piece of wood. And of course, the strings are made of iron wound on copper substrates. But, you know, you have to have some manufacturing in there someplace. But still, the body should not be any more precious to us than a musical instrument or any kind of tool. A tool is valuable insofar as it is useful. The body can be very useful up to a certain point. But once it begins to disintegrate and lose function, then the body becomes an obstacle. And this is inevitable. Why? Because whatever has a beginning has an end. Whatever is born also must die. So the body is like that. The body is born in the beginning. Then it goes through all kinds of transformations. And finally, it reaches decay and death. And there's nothing anybody can do about this. Scientists like to give false hope that, oh, someday we're going to stop death. Huh? But it's always a post-dated check, <laughs> like hydrogen fusion power. <laughs> it's always just 30 years away, you know. Well, maybe somebody's going to get that sooner or later, but they're never going to stop death. It's not possible because the technology, the design, the functioning of the body is beyond human intelligence. So there's no way that we can even understand how it works. What to speak of fixing its ultimate problem. It's not possible. It's never going to happen. Don't even dream about it. <laughs> Don't waste your time. So the body is a tool, but the body is made of things, components, that in and of themselves are not very nice. Therefore, we should be aware of the body because it's a tool. Just like if you have a, a powerful tool, like an electric saw, you want to be very aware of that so that you stay out of danger and it doesn't hurt you, doesn't cut you. Similarly, you want to be very aware of the body and the mind because they're tools, powerful tools. But if they go astray, oh boy, can they hurt you. They can basically pull you into the cycle of birth and death so that you can never escape. And all this is simply because of identification with the body. 
We think the body is myself. No, the body is not yourself. It can never be yourself because you are consciousness. And consciousness is not a function of the body. Huh? Ask any medical man, where in the body is consciousness located? And they'll go, uh, well, they'll try to evade the question, you know. Uh, but actually, even though they have dissected the body completely down to the cellular level now, they still have no clue <laughs> how consciousness arises. The point is, consciousness can only exist as a reflection of pure awareness. We covered that in the series on Drig Drishya Vivekaha. So, because consciousness is a reflection of awareness, only when awareness, the self with a capital S, is attached to the body, identified with the body, or using the body, then only can consciousness arise. It cannot arise without the presence of the self. The self is not the soul, not the individual, but the universal awareness, Brahman, or God. So this should already be understood. This series and this sutta uh, is on the platform of Vivartavada, Raja Yoga. In fact, the techniques given in this sutta are kind of like the very beginning of Raja Yoga, the lowest level of Vivartavada. Vivartavada, remember, is the view that the world is just an appearance. It's not real, it's not concrete. It's really just a thought. And the thoughts that make the world appear real begin with taking the body as the self. So the Buddha, right in the beginning, cuts through this illusion and says, no, the body is not the self. The body is a collection of nasty stuff that you would never want to touch if it wasn't enclosed in a skin bag. So this body is going to die. It's going to break apart and disappear. And before that, it's going to lose function. It's going to decay. It's going to go back to its component elements. And then the next section, we'll look into what those elements are. So this is a program of building awareness step by step. You start with awareness of the breath. That's basic. That's foundational. Awareness of the breath is the basis of all bona fide meditation systems. And then we add layer by layer, one by one, until we reach complete awareness of the body. That's the whole point of the Maha Satipatthana Sutta. One should cultivate these different types of awareness as a foundation for the higher stages of meditation. And we'll get into those, the jhanas, in later series. We've mentioned them before, but we haven't really gone into them in any depth. But it's important that we do so that we understand how the path works. So the path begins from awareness of the body without identification with the body. If we have gone through karma yoga and bhakti yoga, we should already be aware of this. It shouldn't be anything new. Some people try to jump up to vivartavada. They try to just start raja yoga meditation without any preparation, without any preliminaries. But this only leads to difficulty and fall down in the end because one has not accrued a foundation of pious karma necessary to support this mindfulness. 
To really make mindfulness your state of being, you have to do it, you have to practice it 24 hours a day. And that's hard to do if you're working or you're in family life or you have other obligations in the external world that cause you to think that the world is real and that the body is yourself. So one has to be free of all these obligations. And that's why in all scriptures, in all traditions, the path of meditation is presented as appropriate only for sannyasis, for those who have renounced the world, because that is the true path to full enlightenment. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.